Hej Bianca. Bianca. Bianca, are you able to hear me? Um, can you by any chance see the uh, full presentation and not the presenter's view for the PowerPoints? Hi, I think Prudence is here. Hi, Prudence.
Uh, I can't hear you, Bianca, unfortunately. I can hear some sounds. Uh, Okay, that sounds good. Just as long as everyone can hear me speaking, then um, I think it'll all be fine.
Hi, Bianca. Unfortunately, I still can't hear. So uh, all questions will have to be posed in the chat box. Hi. So um, my times are all I'm dropping and changing sometimes. I said three o'clock to you. Oh, sorry. Hi, Emma. Uh, from what I'm aware, we're just waiting uh, for a few more individuals to begin. So we're actually waiting for the school. Oh, yes, yes. We're just waiting for the school. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Okay, I, I can hear now. Uh, I'm not sure what was happening before. I think maybe people might have been muted. Yeah.
Andre. Oh, Andre. Oh, Andre. Yes, Andre. I yes. am. I know. Yes. Okay, Bianca, is everything everything set to start? Okay, great. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today uh, for a talk from the Hearts and Stroke Foundation. Um, I'm very glad to have all of you, and I hope you uh, enjoy the talk. Uh, even though it's via Zoom, I hope it can be as an interactive as possible and that everyone can enjoy it. Uh, please can I also ask if uh, anyone has any questions, uh, just place them in the group chat box and I will monitor the group chat box as I speak, um, but also towards the end, uh, we can have a brief Q&A section where I, I will be able to answer any questions. Um, so yeah, awesome. Thank you and I, I hope you enjoy. So, um, as mentioned, my name is Andrea Tinelli. Uh, I'm currently a fourth year medical student at the University of Cape Town. And I, I'm a volunteer for the uh, Heart and Stroke Foundation South Africa. And uh, today I'll be talking about um, heart health in general. Um, I'll also be talking about hypertension specifically and um, the role of hypertension in COVID-19. Um, so I hope you all enjoy the talk. So um, I'm sure lots of you have seen this statistic before, but just to emphasize the um, critical importance of cardiovascular disease and why it is so important for us to focus on improving our heart health is cardiovascular disease is responsible for the largest burden of disease in the entire world. Uh, we can see these statistics here in 2015, there were 423 million cases of cardiovascular disease, um, causing about 18 million deaths in the world. Again, the largest, uh, the largest number of deaths caused by any uh, category of illness. Uh, there were also uh, some 110 million cases of ischemic heart disease, causing almost 7 million heart attacks and also almost 43 million strokes causing, with 5.39 of those being, uh, 5.39 million being incident. Uh, this again, these huge statistics just really give very powerful evidence of why we have to improve our, do everything we can to improve our own heart health, but also encourage those around us to do the same. So uh, just looking uh, at these numbers in a South African perspective, we can see that uh, almost 225 South Africans are killed by heart diseases every single day, which is a huge amount of people. And uh, globally, almost 13% 13, 13 of all deaths are caused by hypertension alone, um, which is a very scary statistic. That's one disease causing 13% of all the deaths in the world. Um, and uh, in South Africa, about 10 people suffer from a stroke every hour. So we can imagine in a 24-hour period, that's 240 individuals every single day um, on average that are experiencing uh, strokes. And it's a horrible uh, disease that affects you for the rest of your life. Um, so again, it just emphasizes, especially in South Africa, our need to do everything we can to improve our heart health. And the most amazing statistic of this all is that up to 80% of all cardiovascular disease and heart disease specifically 
um, can be prevented if we just take the necessary steps to protect our heart health um, and to minimize the risk factors. 80% uh, of all those deaths that we uh, identified there are preventable. Um, again, emphasizing the need for uh, rapid action in terms of our cardiovascular health. So taking it uh, way back to the basics, uh, when we speak about cardiovascular disease, we can break the word up and refer to cardio as the heart, uh, which pumps our blood around our body. That's uh, one of the most important organs in the body. And then we can also speak about our blood vessels as the vascular parts of that word. And the blood vessels are essentially all the little pipes in your body that carry uh, the blood everywhere to all the tissues and supplies it with the vital oxygen and nutrients that help keep you alive. So any cardiovascular disease is any disease that uh, causes damage to either your heart or the blood vessels themselves. So for us, in order for us to try prevent cardiovascular disease and to um, minimize our chances of developing this, we have to understand what causes heart disease and uh, cardiovascular diseases in general. And these causes are known as risk factors, uh, and they are um, divided into two main groups, the one being unmodifiable and the other one being modifiable. So unmodifiable refers to all the risk factors that uh, we unfortunately cannot change. These include um, our sex, being a male or female. Uh, this involves our age. It also involves the genetics that we inherit from our parents. If either of our parents had uh, some form of cardiovascular disease, like, um, uh, like they experienced hypertension or they had a heart attack, it increases our likelihood of developing that when we get older. And those are factors we can't change. But then there is another group of risk factors known as modifiable risk factors. And this is the huge group of risk factors that we can target in order to reduce our chances of developing any form of cardiovascular disease. Um, and these modifiable risk factors include uh, smoking, uh, it includes high blood pressure, um, it includes uh, high cholesterol, it includes a sedentary lifestyle, meaning we don't exercise enough, um, we're not active. Uh, it can involve a, a being overweight uh, or having a large waist circumference. It involves eating unhealthy food or um, especially unhealthy oils and fats and also living or working in a very stressful and anxiety-driven um, manner. All of these factors, uh, if not controlled, uh, all contribute to an increased risk of developing heart disease. And these are what we can target in order to try reduce the burden of cardiovascular disease and to reduce our own chances of developing um, debilitating cardiovascular disease. So just a very broad overview of how heart disease tends to occur. Um, what happens is a healthy individual we can see on the left here has a nice artery or blood vessel like this, where the walls are nice and healthy and the blood flows very smoothly. But uh, over time, if you uh, have any of those risk factors, like you, you smoke, uh, you're not physically active, you eat a very unbalanced diet, what starts to happen is that you start to damage the walls of these blood vessels. And what starts to happen is fatty-like substances start to deposit in the walls of your arteries around your body. And then over time, uh, sometimes a few years, sometimes many, many years, the walls start to thicken as more and more of this fatty substance deposits underneath. And eventually it'll either lead to a complete blockage of the artery which means the tissue after that artery can no longer receive any nutrients or oxygen and therefore the tissue dies, or um, a, a piece of this can break off and block uh, smaller arteries further down the line. So we can see this is, this is how cardiovascular diseases or the risk factors affect your body and the effects can be very, very detrimental. So um, I'm going to briefly talk about two of the most important cardiovascular diseases just because if you're able to identify the symptoms and signs of these, you could potentially save your own life or significantly reduce the amount of harm that these diseases can occur. So I'll be briefly speaking about um, heart attacks and stroke, as these are two of the most debilitating um, uh, cardiovascular diseases that uh, one can experience. 
So first he's speaking about a heart attack. When, when an individual is experiencing a heart attack, the most common symptoms that they will be experiencing, uh, the number one uh, symptom that people present with is a crushing chest pain. So it literally feels like someone is pressing down very hard over the person's chest and they struggle to breathe. There tends to be, a, this pain tends to radiate either to the arm, the arms of the individual, like the shoulder, and also up to the jaw. An individual can experience uh, difficulty breathing. They can experience very quick fatigue. Uh, I mean, if it's really bad, some person might be lying down and they will be struggling to breathe. Uh, they can experience nausea and dizziness um, and heart palpitations and also sweating. And all of these together suggest that the individual might be experiencing a heart attack. So if you identify this in yourself or if you identify this in uh, someone around you, it's very critical that you get to uh, you get immediate emergency medical attention as soon as possible, because literally every minute counts uh, in terms of the damage that can be done. Uh, so then moving on to stroke, uh, we uh, a stroke again is unfortunately a very, very debilitating disease where part of your brain is not uh, is no longer supplied with oxygen, either because one of the blood vessels burst or there is a blockage in one of the blood vessels and that part of your brain can no longer function because it's not receiving oxygen or any nutrients. So whichever part of your brain is affected, that is where you'll lose your function. So if the part of your brain that controls your speech is affected, you will no longer be able to speak. If uh, the part of your brain that helps control your muscles and the way you move is affected, you'll no longer be able to move those muscles because of a stroke. So it's a very, very, very debilitating disease. And unfortunately, the brain isn't very good at healing itself. So very often, once that function is lost, it's very, very difficult to get back. So uh, the very important and critical signs uh, of a stroke is nicely simplified into uh, this acronym here, which is FOST. So if, you, if you're ever just concerned about stroke and you want to uh, either uh, potentially save someone's life or your own life one day, uh, just remember this brief acronym known as FOST, um, with F standing for FACE. So that means uh, if uh, either on yourself or if you see someone experiencing something similar or what you suspect may be a stroke, you'd ask them to either smile or try and move their face. And if you notice that the one side of the face is unable to move, this is very suggestive that the individual has experienced a stroke. Uh, the same occurs with the arms. You'd ask an individual to try lift up both arms. If they are unable to lift up one arm or the other one moves much faster than the other one, uh, this again suggests uh, the individual may have experienced a stroke. And finally, uh, the last important symptom is uh, speech. Uh, if an individual, uh, you ask an individual to try speak, if their speech is very slurred or it's incoherent and they're unable to speak properly, um, this again can indicate that the individual has experienced a stroke. And the last uh, is T for time. Uh, literally, a couple of minutes can be the difference between never ever talking again and being able to get your full speech back. So it is so important to look out for these risk factors or these particular symptoms and to receive medical attention as soon as possible. Literally minutes can be the difference between never being able to speak again and uh, being able to speak again. So it's, it's absolutely critical. Okay. So uh, moving on to the main topic of this talk, which is hypertension. Uh, so um, in order to know whether an individual has hypertension or not, we have to measure their blood pressure. And uh, the blood pressure is e essentially just the pressure your blood applies on the walls of your arteries. So this is just indicated here by the arrows. We can see it's, it's the pressure that the blood in your blood vessels applies on the walls of all the arteries and veins in your body. And this is normally measured using a blood cuff like this. The fancy medical name for that is a sphygmomanometer, um, which is a, a very unnecessarily long uh, name, but uh, we just like to keep it simple and call it a blood cuff. And this is uh, normally placed on uh, either the right or left upper arm. Um, and I will show a video now demonstrating how the blood pressure is manually uh, measured by doctors and nurses. And, and hopefully, through the video, you might even be able to do it yourself at home because it's so critical to check your blood pressure. 
the current recommendation is to at least get your blood pressure checked once a year. Um, this is just to, for you to be able to monitor your blood pressure over time. Um, as uh, most people actually go uh, day to day not knowing that they may have high blood pressure. Um, so moving on to that, uh, we'll now speak about hypertension, which uh, the, the definition of hypertension is essentially in the name. It just means a high blood pressure. Um, your blood pressure is measured, uh, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar, it's normally shown as a number over another number. The top number normally refers, or the top or the higher number normally refers to your systolic blood pressure. And your systolic blood pressure is the pressure in your arteries when your heart contracts. Um, and then the lower number, or the, 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 lump, the number below the line, is your diastolic blood pressure, which is the blood pressure when the heart is relaxed. So hypertension is known as a silent killer because as I mentioned, most people or a good majority of people may go many, many years without even realizing that they have hypertension. And you will not know, unless you measure your blood pressure on a regular basis, you will not know that you have high blood pressure until something very serious happens, like a stroke, like a um, heart attack, or like with peripheral vascular disease, which is a disease that affects the very small arteries in your body, which causes ulcer and damage to um, the, the soft tissue in your extremities. So that's why, again, it emphasizes it's so important to measure your blood pressure on a regular basis because you are unable to know whether you have high blood pressure or not until you develop some of these severe um, diseases. So, and as we can see there in that final statistic, there's about 30 to 45% of the general population is thought to have high blood pressure. So this is a disease that affects a absolute massive proportion of people around the world. And it just emphasizes, if you currently aren't aware of what your normal blood pressure is, it is highly recommended to just go and get it measured. And I will speak about what different blood pressure measurements mean so that you don't have to panic if you think yours is suddenly high. And I'll explain exactly what's done depending on what the pressure is. So moving on, I'm just going to play a brief video, uh, which basically describes how uh, blood pressure is taken by doctors and nurses in the hospital. And if you, uh, if you would like, you can purchase your own blood cuff from a uh, pharmacy and you'll be able to measure your blood pressure in the same manner. Uh, the, the manual blood pressure cuffs tend to be a lot cheaper, but the electric blood cuffs tend to be a, a lot easier to use. You, you just strap it on your arm and you press one button. So uh, but that's, of, of course, a concern of affordability. So I'm quickly going to play this video for you and you can see how blood pressure is measured. Manual or aneroid equipment includes a cuff, an attached pump, a stethoscope, and a gauge. This equipment requires coordination. It's difficult to use if you're hearing or visually impaired or if you're unable to perform the hand movements needed to squeeze the bulb and inflate the cuff. When you're ready to take your blood pressure, sit quietly for three to five minutes beforehand. To begin, place the cuff on your bare upper arm one inch above the bend of your elbow. Pull the end of the cuff so that it's evenly tight around your arm. You should place it tight enough so that you can only slip two fingertips under the top edge of the cuff. Make sure your skin doesn't pinch when the cuff inflates. Once the cuff is on, place the disc of the stethoscope face down under the cuff just to the inner side of your upper arm. Next, place the stethoscope earpieces in your ears with the earpieces facing forward, pointing toward the tip of your nose. Rest the gauge in the open palm of the hand of your cuffed arm so that you can clearly see it. Then squeeze the pump rapidly with your opposite hand until the gauge reaches 30 points above your usual systolic pressure. Stop squeezing. Turn the knob on the pump toward you to let the air out slowly. Let the pressure fall two millimeters or lines on the dial per second while listening for your heart sounds. Note the reading when you first hear a heartbeat. This is your systolic pressure. 
Note when you no longer hear the beating sounds. This is your diastolic pressure. Rest quietly and wait about one to two minutes before taking another measurement. Record your numbers either by writing the information down or by entering the information into an electronic personal health record. Okay, uh, thank you for watching that. Um, it's quite a nice video that explains in very basic terms how a blood pressure is um, monitored. Another important note is if you want to measure your blood pressure with a manual blood cuff, which was shown in this video here, you also have to have a stethoscope, which is um, that fancy instrument that doctors put into their ears and listen to your heart and stuff with. So um, that together can be more expensive than a electric blood cuff. So for most people at home, the easiest thing to do is to purchase a, a cheaper electric blood cuff um, where you just place the blood cuff on your arm, you press the button and the machine does it all for you. Um, so yeah, I, I hope you enjoyed that brief presentation. Manual or... So now moving on to what your blood pressure readings actually mean. Here we can see the guidelines which are published by the American Heart Association. And basically here we can see that a normal blood pressure is less than 120 on your systolic and less than 80 on your diastolic, meaning when the heart contracts and when the heart relaxes. Okay. So if your blood pressure is below that, then you're safe and you know you are at a, a very low risk of developing cardiovascular disease compared to the other hypertension classes. If your blood pressure is between 120 and 140, or uh, less than 80 up to 90, uh, you're thought to either have an elevated or a stage one hypertension. Currently in the South African guidelines, uh, if you report to the doctor um, and your blood pressure measures uh, between these values, um, your doctor will uh, provide advice on how to reduce your blood pressure, but will recommend for you to measure it uh, every five years. But again, we emphasize that you should measure it at least every year, if not more often, um, for, your, for your own peace of mind rather than every five years, because a lot can change. Um, then if your blood pressure is above 140 on the systolic or above 90 on the diastolic, you're thought to have stage two hypertension. Uh, if your blood pressure is this high, we recommend that you, or the South African guidelines recommend that you see a doctor um, not, it's not a, a medical emergency, so you don't, have to, you don't have to worry. It's not something uh, that is critical or something that can be very dangerous, but it is important that you see a doctor as soon as possible. Um, and the doctor will most probably uh, measure your blood pressure again. And if it is, uh, again, above 140, he, will, uh, he or she will provide you with medication that will help reduce your blood pressure. So only once it's above 140 will the doctor actually prescribe you some form of medication to reduce your blood pressure. And then uh, the most dangerous uh, category of um, hypertension is hi uh, hypertensive crisis. This is when your systolic is above 180 or your diastolic is above 120. And this, uh, if your blood pressure is above 180, you should report to the clinical hospital as soon as possible you should see a doctor immediately and they will refer you for specialist treatment to try and diagnose because this can be very, very dangerous if your blood pressure is kept above uh, these values for a sustained period of time. So then uh, moving on, um, a, a, quite a common misconception or uh, what people don't understand is how exactly hypertension affects you in the long run. And the reason why a lot of people struggle to maintain their blood pressure over a long period of time is that its negative effects take many, many years to develop. And over many, many years, if your blood pressure is kept at a high level, um, like above that 140, the stage two hypertension that we mentioned, you will eventually develop something called target organ damage, which is one of the final complications of uh, hypertension. Uh, and this target organ damage uh, damages may, uh, various very vital, important organs in your body. Two of the most important ones we mentioned were the heart, where it can cause a myocardial infarct, which is just the medical term for a heart attack. And it can also cause uh, strokes, as we mentioned in the brain. Uh, the high blood pressure itself can also affect all the blood arteries in your body, where it can cause atherosclerosis, 
which is the thickening of the blood vessels that we saw earlier, which can damage the walls and uh, block them completely. It can also damage your, the, the small, delicate blood vessels in your eyes, where it can cause very small bleeds and can actually uh, hurt your vision and eventually might even result in blindness. And it can also um, damage your kidneys. And your kidneys are so critical to remove uh, certain drugs and toxins from your body. So um, if your kidneys aren't functioning properly, those toxins build up and that starts to damage all the other organs in your body. So this is just gives you quite a nice picture of what the effects of long-term high blood pressure can have on your body. And it's very, very detrimental. So now moving on to COVID-19 and the role that hypertension has to play in COVID-19. Uh, this is just a brief introduction. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard much about the virus and you're quite sick of hearing the word COVID-19. But uh, just to be clear, um, COVID-19 is a respiratory illness, which is caused by the virus, which is known as SARS-CoV-2, which is the um, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, um, is the full name. Um, and that causes uh, COVID-19. And uh, I'm sure a lot of you, again, are very familiar, but just to re-emphasize, the major symptoms of COVID-19 are um, a fever, a dry cough, and a chronic fatigue or tiredness. Uh, much of the less common symptoms include aches and pains, headaches, sore throat, uh, diarrhea, and also loss of taste and smell. I know a lot of these symptoms are quite general and a lot of people, they might read this and worry that they're experiencing this currently, but I'd like to emphasize that the two most important symptoms for COVID-19 are a dry cough and a fever. And if you've been experiencing either of these for um, several days now, I, I really recommend going to a, a local COVID-19 testing center in order to get a test result done. Um, and then uh, just briefly out of interest, the virus uh, originated from bats in, uh, in uh, China um, and the virus spread from bats to pangolins. And uh, at the Hubei uh, market in Wuhan, uh, people who consumed the pangolin meat um, contracted the virus. And that's currently the main theory of how the virus um, broke out. Um, and the, the virus is spread through respiratory droplets, which means that the virus particles themselves like to sit in the mucus and uh, the, the, the sputum in your mouth. And when you cough or sneeze, uh, either directly onto another individual or onto a surface, another individual can then touch these respiratory droplets, which are spread into the air. Um, and when they touch their own mouth or nose, it can then spread and they can contract the virus. So that's essentially how it's currently believed to be uh, spread. And just to emphasize uh, how um, widespread and uh, damaging this pandemic currently is, as of the 5th of July, there were 11 million cases worldwide, uh, causing some 526,000 deaths and uh, it's affected 216 countries and territories around the world. So it's, the, the effect has been absolutely global. I don't think there's any corner of the world that has not been affected by COVID-19. So these two graphs here depict the effects of having hypertension and COVID-19 and the dangers of this. And this just re-emphasizes the critical need to help control your blood pressure to reduce your risk of developing severe COVID-19. So if we look here on the first graph here, this graph shows the proportion of individuals who died of COVID-19 and the amounts of comorbidities they had. So a comorbidity is essentially having a disease at the same time as having another disease or simultaneously. So for example, a comorbidity would be like having COVID-19 and diabetes, having COVID-19 and hypertension. And you can have multiple co uh, comorbidities. You can have a lot of the patients who present to Kruteski will have five or six comorbidities. They will have COVID-19, hypertension, diabetes. Uh, they'll have heart disease. Uh, it's, it's people. So that's essentially what a comorbidity is. So on this graph here, we can see only 12% of individuals who died of COVID-19 had no comorbidities but 88% of every individual that has died of COVID-19 has had at least one comorbidity. 
uh, with a very important one being hypertension. So we can see how the having, having these comorbidities really increases your risk of developing severe COVID-19 and um, unfortunately passing on from the disease. This graph here also shows in South Africa, um, if we, uh, this shows the proportion of individuals aged over 20 who have died from COVID-19 and who have comorbidities. And here at the bottom, they list the different kinds of comorbidities that individuals are presented with. And we can see in the yellow here is hypertension. So in the younger age groups, uh, it's not so important. Um, but uh, in the age groups of 50 to 59, 60 to 69, and over 70, we can see that almost 60, just above 60 percent here, and almost 75 percent of every individual who passed on from COVID-19 in these age groups had hypertension. So it just shows that a massive proportion, the vast majority of these people um, who died of COVID-19 had hypertension at the same time which suggests that having hypertension increases your risk of developing severe COVID-19 and ultimately succumbing to the disease. So moving on, just to look at some facts uh, about COVID-19 and the cardiovascular system. Uh, as mentioned, cardiovascular disease is shown to have a high prevalence um, in those who are affected with COVID-19. Uh, so more than, interestingly, more than 7% of individuals with COVID-19 also had some form of heart damage, which suggests that the virus might be able to damage the heart tissue also, although evidence is still coming out for this and this needs to be substantiated further. Um, looking at smoking, uh, the World Health Organization has uh, suggested that uh, smoking uh, increases your risk of infection with COVID-19. It will also increase the severity of disease you might experience if you are a smoker and you contract COVID-19. Um, and this, uh, some people think that maybe vaping is a safer alternative, but the World Health Organization again emphasizes that this is just not true. And that uh, vaping has a similar, if not worse effect uh, in terms of increasing your risk of developing severe disease. Uh, our own Department of Health has reported that the most common comorbidities associated with severe COVID-19 are first hypertension, then diabetes, and then other cardiac diseases. Um, and so again, this just emphasizes how important it is to control your blood pressure and to take the necessary steps in protecting yourself. Um, and the World Heart Federation has some nice suggestions uh, in order to reduce your risk of severe COVID-19 uh, in terms of your cardiovascular system. And here they recommend that you continue to exercise regularly, you eat a balanced diet, you, you stay hydrated, you drink water frequently, and that you try to get adequate sleep. They also suggest that you maintain your social networks and you try to limit the amount of information you consume. I know a lot of people right now will sit with the news open and uh, go onto their phones or constantly read the newspaper. And too much of this is not good for you because it can cause unnecessary stress and anxiety, which uh, has a detrimental effect on your body as it releases hormones in your body that uh, suppresses your immune system. And if your immune system is not functioning properly, you can experience more severe disease. So this is the recommendations from the World Health Federation, but we'll go into some more detail now. So uh, here are just some helpful resources. Uh, if you're interested in reading more about Corona um, and COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2, um, again, there's so much misleading information out there. We really recommend that you use the evidence-based sources that are available to get the most the current facts and to not be misled by what you might find on the internet. Uh, and the, the first uh, website is the SA coronavirus, uh, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Then there's the NICD, which is the National Institute of Communicable Diseases, which is responsible for South Africa's response to the COVID-19. Um, they are a government agency that helps control uh, pandemics and epidemic outbreaks. Then there's the World Health Organization. They have an information page on uh, COVID-19. And finally, there's the World Heart Federation, which has uh, more information on COVID-19 and cardiovascular diseases in particular. So these are just some very useful resources that individuals can use uh, in order to uh, attain proper current evidence that is uh, researched and uh, not false or misleading. 
So uh, basically, I'd just like to now speak about some steps that you can take uh, in order to prevent hypertension or to reduce your blood pressure uh, if you are currently hypertensive. So one of the first uh, and most important uh, actions or behavior an individual has that uh, really can increase your risk of developing cardiovascular disease is smoking. And in South Africa alone, there are about 80 million cigarettes smoked each day. Um, which is an absolute huge number. Uh, and almost one in five people in South Africa are current smokers. Um, and there's mounds and mounds of evidence that shows that smoking increases your risk of developing a whole range of cardiovascular diseases. It helps, uh, it helps damage your blood vessel walls. It uh, thins the arteries and causes them to constrict, uh, which can all increase your likelihood of developing stroke and um, having heart attacks in the long run. So quitting smoking, considering quitting smoking, reducing your smoking if, um, if quitting is too difficult is one of the first steps we could ever recommend if you are currently a smoker. Um, then uh, moving on, uh, another step you can take is exercising more. Um, uh, exercise uh, has huge benefits in terms of your cardiovascular health. Um, it uh, reduces your risk of developing or almost every cardiovascular disease uh, out there. And the current recommendation is 150 minutes per week of moderate activity. Moderate means any activity that you would, that would cause you yourself to break out into a, a minor sweat or to get you to start breathing a bit much. So like a, a little walk outside wouldn't be considered moderate activity, but maybe a fast walk or something that gets your, your breathing up a bit and uh, causes you to sweat. And if you think about that, it's only half an hour, five days a week. So if you're playing soccer every single day uh, outside for half an hour, that is essentially all the recommended exercise you need to significantly reduce your risk of developing heart disease. Uh, so if you, uh, if you do more vigorous activity like sprinting, running, uh, cycling, any, any kind of other activity that's uh, a lot more strenuous on the body, uh, it's recommended that you only, need this, uh, you only need to do an hour of this each week. So if you, if you do more intense exercise, only three sessions of 20 minutes a week is uh, what is recommended in order to reduce uh, your risk of developing hypertension and other cardiovascular diseases. Then moving on to your diet, uh, um, the South African guidelines currently uh, suggest a balanced diet that can help, again, decrease your risk of developing uh, cardiovascular diseases and help reduce um, your blood pressure, especially with regards to hypertension. So uh, in terms of fruits and vegetables, they recommend that you eat uh, at least five of vegetables. Um, if we look at your proteins, they, the recommendation is to go for either fish or your lean meats. Uh, your, your healthier, one of your healthiest meats being chicken uh, and trying to avoid the more red meats or the more fat laden meats uh, is recommended. Fish is one of the healthiest, but it's not always accessible. So always recommend chicken or other lean meats. Uh, eggs are a fantastic source of protein. And for individuals um, who don't eat uh, animal-based products, other really important sources of protein uh, are plant-based foods like lentils, beans, kidney beans, and chickpeas, which are all fantastic sources of natural um, plant-based protein, um, which can really help uh, improve your health. Then uh, if we look at starches, my, uh, my approach to starches is always looking to eat the most unprocessed carbohydrates that you can. Uh, so for example, with bread, to eat whole wheat or to eat seeded rye bread rather than your processed white bread. Uh, with cereals to eat like all bran flakes that are high in fiber rather than your sugar cereals like Cheerios and all that. Again, oats is a fantastic source, sweet potatoes, chickpeas again uh, are all fun. So the more unrefined and the more unprocessed the carbohydrate is, the more healthy that they tend to be and the better they are for your body. Because the more unrefined it is, the more slowly the energy is released into your body. It actually helps keep you going more throughout the day um, and is much better for your body in terms of your cardiovascular health. And then uh, another very important uh, contributor towards high blood pressure is excessive salt intake. 
So salt is uh, sodium chloride, as the slides mentioned. Salt essentially makes your blood uh, thicker. And what it does is it draws the water out from your tissues into your blood vessels. And this causes your blood vessels to swell and thus increase your blood pressure. Um, so in order to help, uh, or a great way of reducing your uh, general blood pressure is to reduce the amount of salt that you eat every day. The World Health Organization recommends that uh, an, any individual should only eat about five grams per day. And that's just about one level teaspoon. Currently in South Africa, the average is about 8.5 grams per day, which is, uh, as we can see, almost 70%, uh, 50, about 60, 70% more than the recommended guidelines. Um, so uh, if you would like to reduce your blood pressure, reducing your salt intake is a fantastic way of doing this. And just some tips uh, with regards to this. Um, uh, in order to reduce your salt intake, you can uh, reduce it gradually because I, I know a lot of us love a lot of salt in our food. Um, so this can be done in a gradual process, slowly eating less and less. Uh, you can remove the salt shaker from either uh, the, the, the um, table where we eat or um, even from the kitchen if you want to be that, um, if you want to be that uh, serious about this. Uh, and also to try to cook with other um, spices and herbs and chili that can help try replace what you miss from salt. And also um, to read food labels. Uh, the South African Hearts and Stroke Foundation, if you see here, we have this logo here on the left. Uh, and certain companies will come to the Hearts and Stroke Foundation and if their food is considered to be um, healthy and safe for you to eat uh, in terms of your cardiovascular health, um, you will see this logo on it. So if you look out for products that have this logo on the left here, you know that they are safe to eat in, um, in terms of protecting your uh, cardiovascular health and your heart health in general. Then uh, finally speaking about fats, uh, it's um, so the healthiest kind of fat you can look for is a fancy chemical name known as polyunsaturated fatty acids. Uh, it's not really too useful to remember that, but it's just useful to remember that polyunsaturated fats tend to be found in vegetable-based oils, in, uh, in certain uh, fruits like avocados, and then also in nuts and seeds, uh, even fish oil itself. Um, so these kinds of oils, uh, plant-based nuts and seeds and avos are fantastic sources of um, very healthy proteins. So rather than your butter, rather than your margarine, um, it's better to eat these kinds of fats or to cook with these kinds of fats. Um, again, really helps contribute and reduce your risk of uh, developing uh, severe cardiovascular disease. And then again, one of the greatest uh, contributors to poor cardiovascular health is um, sugar intake. Uh, high sugar intake can lead to pre-diabetes and diabetes in the long run if it's excessive. Um, and it is one of the most damaging dietary substances there is if it's eaten in uh, excess. Uh, it's currently recommended that sugar should make up less than 5% of your daily energy intake. Um, and just for perspective, that's only six to nine teaspoons each day. So one flavored water. So if you just go into your uh, local garage or your local shop um, and you buy one little bottle of flavored water, that bottle has all the sugar you should be eating in a single day. Um, so just to remember, six to nine teaspoons is the recommended max. And one little bottle of flavored water has all of that in a day. So trying to reduce your uh, sugar intake in the long term will have massive benefits uh, in, in improving your health. Hey, so uh, that brings us almost to the end. So just as a take home message, um, it's we can really see by the uh, burden of cardiovascular disease around the world that it's very important that we focus on our heart health and our cardiovascular health. Um, if we are not careful in controlling high blood pressure and other symptoms, it can uh, severely hurt our, our heart and lead to all the diseases that I mentioned and spoke about. Um, having hypertension and other comorbidities can increase your risk of developing severe COVID-19. Um, and so to protect yourself, your, to prolong your life and to ensure you can live a longer, healthier life and a happier life, um, we recommend uh, moving more, 
uh, by exercising, meeting that 150 minutes of moderate exercise each, um, each week, uh, by eating healthier, me, uh, all, all the various steps that I mentioned, re reducing salt intake, reducing sugar intake, uh, increasing your healthy fats and healthy protein, all will contribute in the long run to good cardiovascular health. Also to uh, always consider quitting smoking if you are currently a smoker. Smoking is one of the uh, top behaviors that can really damage your health in the long run. It also increases your risk of developing severe COVID-19. Um, and then also finally to monitor your blood pressure regularly and to uh, make sure that you take these steps in reducing it as far as possible and maintaining it as a healthy level at a healthy level for in the long term. And this will really benefit you in the long run. So uh, thank you all uh, for listening to me so much. Uh, these are just some contact details of the South African Heart and Stroke Foundation. If you would like some more information uh, about what I've been speaking about and uh, all the other health tips uh, on how to prevent cardiovascular disease and hypertension, you can access our website. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook or also follow us on Twitter. Um, you can uh, send an email if you have any ideas or questions and also contact us um, via the phone. So yeah, thank you so much for listening to this talk. I really appreciate it. I know Zoom unfortunately is not the most ideal, but I hope you all took uh, some valuable information out of this and I really appreciate it. I'll just leave the contact details up here of the Heart and Stroke Foundation. So, oh, so before I end, does anyone have any questions uh, from the school? Uh, if there are any questions, please just post them in the um, in the box here, and I will do my best to answer any of them. Sam, um, if the principal has any questions.
Hello. We're just asking the principal if she has any questions. Hello. Hello. Oh, Sam, that's you. No. I think the thing is occurring, so I'd like your voice. Andrea, I see that there seems to be no questions. Um, it's Sasha here from the Heart and Stroke Foundation. Does anyone have any questions? I, see, I guess no one has any questions. So we just want to say thank you so much for your assistance with this presentation. It was really, really informative. Um, if there are any questions, can we forward them to you? Maybe people are a little bit shy to ask in front of everybody. Sure, no problem. I, I can uh, give my email uh, on the chat here. And then if anyone has any questions, uh, they more than what well, e even not about the presentation, if anyone's interested in medicine and studying medicine at UCT, I'm more than happy to answer any questions and help people with that also. So I put my email address there on the chat and people are welcome to email me uh, if they have any questions or concerns. So thank you, Sasha. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, so everyone, as Andrea said, his email is in the chat if you have any questions relating to the presentation itself or anything about being starting to become a doctor, he's available to chat to you. Thanks so much. Okay, goodbye. Have a lovely week, everyone. Thank you, Andrea. Bye. Bye.